Don't call it a comeback. The, GOT, the GOP's been here for years. This is Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz, joined each week by boss-busting journalists from around the state, including Catherine Landrigan, the New Jersey Bureau Chief for Politico and J, Michael Simons, the State House Bureau Chief for New Jersey 101.5, and Charles Style, the political columnist for the record USA Today Networks. We'll hear from them in a couple of minutes, but we start today with the political comeback story of the year. No, it's not Chris Christie. It's the post-Chris Christie New Jersey Republican Party. Seven seats in the state legislature, almost the big upset in the governor's race, and now pushing the boundaries with demonstrations against mask mandates and starting a hashtag, give it back. The GOP is feeling pretty good about itself as it gathers for a party summit this weekend. And I mean political party summit, of course, in Atlantic City. That's where we find Senate Minority Leader Steve Orojo. Senator, good to see you again. David, good to see you, and thank you for having me. So your party is, as I said, feeling pretty good about itself, huh? Yeah, and, and David, thank you. We obviously we have more seats we've got to pick up for the for the majority, but uh, in the last election, we believe also in this uh, congressional. Uh, election year, um, and then obviously next year, uh, that, you know, with the momentum we have, and it's, it's going to take a lot of hard work, but we're ready for it. And um, we think uh, New Jersey voters are ready for it, too. So now you have a summit of Republicans in Atlantic City this weekend. What's on the agenda? Well, first of all, just getting uh, everybody together. So, you know, working on on the same page, what's important. Um, and David, the most important thing is getting the right message out. Uh, you hear a lot of people, each party, from the governor to the to speaker to the Senate president, and obviously Assembly um, Leader John DeMeo, myself, they're talking about you know, affordability, but the Republicans have been talking about it for, for decades. Um, one thing I'd say is, you, you know, the Republicans have had these ideas for, for 10 years. You give the Republicans the majority. And, you know, people won't have to wait 10 years to, to have the affordability. Hmm. All right. You got Ben Carson as a speaker, a panel of conservative radio hosts, plus sessions like winning on all fronts and restoring law mm -hmm. and order. It, it feels a little bit like post-election, the parties are having to confront the fact that the left and the right are battling for the souls of, of the two parties. We see that among Democrats for sure. But you guys, I mean... In your primary for governor, the two conservatives got more of the vote than the guy, more of the vote than the guy who won. Is there a battle in your party mm -hmm. uh, with the right wing? No, I don't think so. I, it, I think there's you know plenty of issues that we all agree on, and when you take a look at it, one of the things that um, the Republicans, as well as uh, you know a number of the um, you know Democrats, agreed on was the fact that. Um, this governor had overextended his uh, executive powers. Uh, parents were, uh, you know, fed up with the fact that, you know, government control was taking uh, where, you know, parent control should have been. Uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, we could understand um, because there was a lot of unknowns that was uh, occurring. But throughout, throughout the past two years, um, you know, people have gotten fed up with, you know, government telling them all the time what to do. And uh, I think that resonated with a lot of people. And quite frankly, the Republicans, you know, I put together a listing of, um, you know, issues that we've been you know, pushing for, you know, some more than 10 years of, you know, parental, you know, parental choice, parental control. Um, and I think people are, are, are hearing that message now. I, I get all that, but you've got the party, uh, you've got a John Bramnick in there and you got a Mike Doherty. Those two guys, can they coexist in your party? Oh, sure. Absolutely. And, and one of the things, uh, David, that people think is look, each, each district is different. And our, obviously the party has to recognize that uh, core values will be, you know, will be the same, every, you know, as far as agreeing on the fact that uh, people want to have personal freedoms uh, as opposed to government dictates. I think that is something that's 
you know, very much, um, you know, agreeable to, you know, to everybody, but everybody's district is going to be, a, you know, a little bit different. Um, and I will, I will tell you that, you know, Mike Darty and John Bremnick, you know, talk all, all the time. Um, and let's say you, you hear that New Jersey is a very diverse kind of state. And, that, and, then, and that's very true. Um, and the one, the, the key thing that you're going to find that we've always said is that, you know, for an individual um, elected official, it's true that they stay uh, true to their core principles. And that's what the people and that's what the people of their district elect. All right. Let me get a couple of questions in here uh, from the panel. Yeah. Catherine Lander. Hi. One question I had was on the issue of affordability. Um, if there is one bill that you could pick to move alongside the budget and one that you think Democrats could get behind, what would it be? Well, there's, um, you know, Catherine, and everybody's, and thanks for the question, everybody's been talking about property taxes. It's been our number one issue for a uh, for, for decades and decades. Um, the Republicans had in place something called the, it's getting in the weeds a little bit, but the energy tax receipts where uh, administrations from both Republicans and Democrats have taken that money that should have been at the municipal level. And this has happened many, many times, but at the municipal level, um, the Republicans had a bill in place to, to send those uh, funds and it's a significant amount of money back to the municipalities to use directly for property tax relief, uh, not expanded programs. The, um, the majority party um, has, has actually taken that bill and, and uh, the Senate um, has already um, you know, passed it at the, um, at the, at the Senate budget uh, level. So uh, I'm hoping that that you know, bill will go through, but that's a bill that uh, we've been sponsoring for more than a decade. So the idea of that affordability, and that's one thing I think would help you know, pretty much right away. There's, there's a lot of others too. David Freeze. I think so. <laughs> oh. He's back. Charlie, you had a question you wanted to join us with? Who, me? Charlie, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, you, you froze there for a second. I know. Um, yeah, Senator. Um, on this issue of affordability, uh, Republicans for years, uh, one of their talking points is has been that Trenton or government should be returning money back to taxpayers. It shouldn't be, you know, taking it and overspending it or whatever the, you know, the uh, theme has been. So with that as a context, do you support the governor's uh, anchor rebates? And if not, what do you think that money should be used for. We've seen a long pileup of um, infrastructure, governmental infrastructure needs like unemployment insurance, computers, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. so what do you think that money um, might be better spent on? Well, Charlie, first, thank you very much. And the ACRA program is just a renaming of the uh, Homestead, you know, the, the rebate programs. Um, they put it out as if it was a brand new program type thing, but it, it's not. This, the uh, Senate Republicans actually put out a plan to, to um, give a, you know, up to a thousand dollar tax credit because the amount of money that uh, the, this um, uh, administration has overtaxed, we heard um, when the governor gave his budget address that we're going to be $4.6 billion higher than what they expected when they uh, put the budget uh, together back in you know uh, last year, so that that's money that could go back you know directly to the to the taxpayers. But Charlie, the one thing that uh, is, is never addressed and it needs to be addressed for affordability is those cost drivers at the you know pr you know pretty much at, you know at the state, the county, and the local level. That's you know causing the um, you know uh, cost of government to go up. And we could do as many rebate programs as possible, but unless you start to really go after, and we tried, you know, I was a co-chair on a bipartisan basis with Senator Sarlo, I know Senator Singleton uh, was, was there, uh, some of the women, uh, Ileana Pentamarin was, was, was a co-chair as well, for the path to progress. And those went after the real cost drivers, 
And until we start doing and going after the cost drivers, the, you know, the rebate programs could go up and up and up. But it's, it's still going to be the fact that uh, the cost of government is going up and therefore the rebate programs have to go up. So you have to collect that money from somewhere. So the idea of going after the cost drivers and I'll, I'll still keep with those recommendations of the path to progress. I think we still have a lot of opportunity there. Mike Simons, quick question. We're now two and a half months into the new legislative session. So I was wondering what your assessment was of how much influence and input Republicans are having, particularly um, you know, with Senate President Scutari now in charge. Well, Michael, thank you very much. And I tell you, I've been a number of places with Senator Scutari. Listen, you know, Republicans and Democrats were never necessarily going to agree on things, but I found the Senate President to be very, um, you know, deliberative, uh, very uh, collegial with uh, with me. We've had many, many discussions. Uh, as I said, I've been on many, many panels. And if you take a look at it, a lot of the bills that have that are coming up have been uh, Republican bills for quite a while. Now they are obviously uh, bipartisan bills, which is fine with us. The issue is, you know, getting the things done. But um, I will say that, you know, the Senate president has been, as I said, very deliberative and, um, you know, very respectful. So will we always agree? No. Will it be professional? I believe it will be. All right, Senator, last one. Tell me the year when the GOP flips the legislature. Oh, so I'd love it to be in, in 2023. Uh, we're certainly going to work hard uh, for that. Um, What's I your prediction? Have, listen, 2023. All right. <laughs> All right, Senator Steve Morrow, Senator Minardo leader, host of Saturday evening's reception, by the way, along with John DeMeo. I will note that it ends at 8 p.m. The leader is an early to bed, early to rise, to rise guy. Senator, <laughs> good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on in good sport. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. All right. All right, panel, let's get you back in here. Catherine, Mike, Charles. The GOP is A-OK -okay and ready to flip the assembly in 23. You heard it. Charles, is it a surge or just baby steps for this party? No, I, I think they're um, I, 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 somewhere in between, maybe. I don't know what that you might want to call that, but they definitely have momentum and energy on their side right now. And I think part of it is the fatigue of uh, Democratic Party rule over the past, much of the last two decades, really, if you want to, even with the exception of uh, Christian power, the, the legis they dominated the legislature for a long time. So, um, and I think, you know, they ended up, um, maybe that map, um, the legislative map gives them some more opportunity. So, yeah, I, I, I think the one issue that overhangs it is, is the party is the national brand is still, and I, I get, every time I bring this up, I get, you know, told to take a hike, but I think the national brand is a problem. And as we saw with the U.S. Supreme Court uh, not a confirmation process, we saw a very ugly, xenophobic, almost racist tone coming out of those hearings. And I think a lot of suburban voters, um, a lot of young voters look at that and say, there's no way I could ever hitch myself to the Republican Party. And it's a real problem. Michael, you work around a lot of Republicans on the radio. Does it feel different on the radio? <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess so. I mean, there's uh, certainly, I mean, part, part of why last year turned out the way that it did is because of a lot of enthusiasm among Republicans, um, particularly yeah. in South Jersey. So I don't know that the map necessarily makes it likely that the legislature is uh, going to flip. I mean, the the fourth district in South Jersey changed quite a bit, but other than that, a lot of the changes were were marginable, margin, marginal. So there'll be some competitive races, but I don't know. I don't know if it's enough to flip the legislature in 2023, but who knows what the atmosphere will be then. Catherine, my inbox is flooded with GOP news like never before. Is it just better PR? I mean, the Democrats still control all the big chairs right now. Definitely good PR. I mean, they have uh, been really aggressive on that front. Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, a, I would agree with what Charlie and Mike said. It's really unlikely to see a flip, but um, the energy is there. The momentum is there. I mean, 
Democrats did not see this last election coming. Um, you know, none of the internal polling picked it up. I think it was just a huge shock. Um, and and so, yeah, there's definitely something here. Charlie, in honor of St. Peter's basketball's NCAA run, you get the Waterfront Commission question. Oh, I, won't ask you to, I won't ask you to explain what the Waterfront Commission actually is. Rather, just tell us, if you can, why the public might want to care about New Jersey so ardently wanting to leave the commission. Well, I, that, that's actually a, a really good question, and I'm, I don't think they've really articulated it very well. I mean, it, it was set up in the early 1950s to sort of uh, minimize or, or keep the mob a, away from the waterfront, to keep the Johnny yeah. friendlies from, you know... <laughs> And the mob running that place. Um, it's, uh, but we've heard complaints from the unions that it's been nothing more than a kind of a meddlesome um, bureaucracy that doesn't really do what it's set out to do, and it's um, it's only reinforced old stereotypes. The fact of the matter is, uh, New York wants uh, to stay. New Jersey wants to maintain. It's a bipartisan uh, operation. Um, but it, uh, no one's really, no, we haven't had any kind of independent analysis as to whether it really works or whether state police, which New Jersey wants to uh, fill the void, really that, whether that is really the, the way to go. I have no, and no one really has any idea. It's, we're, we're operating in a vacuum. You know, I wanted to ask you, Charlie, because you're the, the senior member of this panel. Um, Thank you for that. This murder for hire, <laughs> this murder for hire case, the Sean Cattle case. It gets yes. curiouser and curiouser. I yeah. uh, don't know if you saw Ray Lesniak on with us last week, but it has certainly yeah. caused him some consternation. Does this thing have legs, as they say? Well, you know, we were talking about this yesterday. I mean, there is a possibility. Uh, yes, it could have legs uh, because there's just we, we just we're just still, uh, again, operating in a vacuum. You don't know really what the motive uh, was behind the, um, the hiring of these two assassins. We don't know um, what he's cooperating, Sean Cattle is cooperating the feds with. Um, but there's always a possibility that this whole case could just wrap up and we'll never know. We'll never, right. we'll never have the, the, the car, feds may never show their cards on this. So it is really, we're operating in stranger than fiction territory here. I don't, I can't remember anything like this. I'm from Hudson County, and of course, Hudson County plays a role in this. I used to cover the police beat in North Hudson, so I've seen some yeah. odd stories. I wonder if any of you recall the weirdest story you ever covered. Catherine? So the weirdest story, probably New Jersey politics, I would say. It's not really a strange story itself, but more the response. So I was um, Governor Phil Murphy, or he was elected at the time, had written a letter to then Governor Chris Christie asking for him to freeze spending. So it's kind of a wonky issue. Um, right. And Governor Christie actually spent, instead of just responding for comment, he spent the entire day of his Sunday writing a response just for my article. Um, it was very <laughs> strange and surreal. Um, so that was a very typical Christie move. <laughs> Right. Michael Simons? Yeah, I mean, literally whole books have been written about how crazy New Jersey politics is. Yeah. Um, what, when, when you asked about sort of strange stories, I mean, you know, Governor McGreevy resigning, <laughs> obviously, there's a, kind of difficult to top a governor being left from office. Um, part of what I remember about that is that that was my first day as news editor for Gannett Newspapers at the State House, um, where Bob Ingle wasn't there. So um, we thought that there was, you know, at the, in the morning, there was supposed to be a press conference about the announcement of the new personnel commissioner. And that is not what got announced that day. And uh, so that's kind of a, a strange story with also like a, a, a strange day for me. Charlie, I, I didn't get, I didn't get one from you. Well, I, I, I mean, there's that, there's no death, no question about that being a, a stranger than fiction. Bridgegate to me, I didn't believe it at first, and it just got weirder. But I, I think when I, going back to the uh, street money scandal of uh, Christy Whitman getting elected in 1993, only to have Ed Rollins 
you know, brag at a breakfast the next morning that they nice. paid street workers to suppress the vote. I mean, we spent r- weeks of running around trying to chasing that story, including getting street workers in a in my car and trying to, you know, riding around the city of Trenton looking for these polling places where they and people trying to round up people that allegedly did this and and the guy didn't produce it and he ended up asking me for twenty five dollars. So <laughs> It was weird. <laughs> you know, I, I have uh, done interviews where, where people have asked me for money at the end. I was like, wait a minute. That's not how this works. Anyway, it is uh, budget season. We've had the first two uh, public sessions, virtual, though they may have been. Um, with so much money floating around the state house, is there no chance that we'll have a government lockout, uh, Catherine? I would. I would be shocked. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just so much money right now that's floating around. Um, yeah, we saw in the budget hearings this week, they're very much like the ones that we've seen in past years where folks come and, you know, make their ask on behalf of their group or cause. Um, but the difference this year is that there is money and this is usually something that we we don't see in New Jersey. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of a government shutdown, I'd be shocked, uh, yeah. <laughs> Michael Simons, come on. Hope springs eternal. They're going to have to argue over something, right? Oh, they'll find things to argue about, but no one should hope for a government shutdown. Um, but yeah, I mean, even, I mean, even in those hearings. We are literally that- talking right now, we are literally talking to the summer lockout chef right here, Michael Simon. <laughs> that is true. He handles the barbecue and everything. Barbecue. Good one, Joe. Good one. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, even in the hearings this week, there were still asks for additional money. So, um, yeah. kind of, no matter how big the budget gets, there are always additional things that you that you could allot money towards. So, there'll there'll still be things to debate about, um, even in good times. But uh, as Catherine said, uh, I don't think anyone thinks this is going to lead to a, a shutdown sort of scenario. All right, let's finish with the Supreme Court nominee hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Here's Senator Cory Booker doing his best Cory Booker and bringing the room to tears. You did not get there because of some left-wing agenda? You didn't get here because of some dark money groups? You got here how every black woman in America who's gotten anywhere has done by being (laughs) like Ginger Rogers said, I did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards in heels. <laughs> and, and so I, I'm just sitting here saying, nobody's stealing my joy. Nobody's going to make me angry. You know, for every I am Spartacus moment, you will get something like that. When Cory Booker can really nail the cultural and historic significant uh, significance of a moment. Charlie, no, did he nail it there? Yes, he did. And um, it was long overdue. Uh, again, it was an atrocious attack on a very qualified, uh, more than qualified woman for the Supreme Court. And it really, I think it was, as I said earlier, I think it was a, 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 a colossal mistake and embarrassment for the Republican Party going forward in the future. Catherine, did you watch some of this and what did you think of, of Booker's presentation? Yeah, I mean, I I ended up watching kind of bits and pieces. And yeah, I mean, it was very much, I think, as you said, kind of authentic Booker. I mean, I think he really, um, and he's a very earnest guy. And I think it was just an emotional moment for him as a Black senator, you know, seeing a Black woman in front of him going through this process. Um, And so it just felt like a very, a very raw moment. Yeah. All right. No matter what happens, St. Peter's University has had a great run. Uh, Michael Simons, lasting impact of this NCAA bid? Uh, A lot of people now know uh, where St. Peter's University is. So they got a lot of attention and and publicity and good for them and go Peacocks. Charlie, wrap it up for us. Assemblyman Parker Space retiring. Good riddance or we're going to miss you, pal. Well, I think he, 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 we're going to miss the copy, but um, I think for the body politic, uh, really, frankly, good riddance. Who needs that? He's He is ascending now as the kind of 
wing of the party that he kind of represented is ascendant, no? I don't know about ascendant. They're certainly noisy and flamboyant and um, uh, we'll see. I don't, it's hard to quantify, but I think it's a real problem. I think it's a real, um, uh, uh, you know, problem for the party going forward. All right, Charlie, Mike, Catherine, good to see you all. Thanks for coming on. That is Roundtable for the week. Our thanks also to Senator Steve Oraho. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz NJ and subscribe to the YouTube channel for important live streams and more. Chatbox, Business Beat, and NJ Spotlight News. Thank you for being with us. I'm David Cruz. For all the crew over here, have a great week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com. Thank you.